Yep. So, okay. as Ken said, my name is Corey Weistuck. I'm uh, in the Department of Applied Mathematics and the Lawfare Center. Today I'm going to be talking about my defense principles of dynamics and inference with applications of the brain. So this work was co-advised by Ken and Lily and Mohika Parodi. So it's going to have kind of a flair of the statistical physics, but also, you know, brain modeling and stuff. Um, roughly speaking, this presentation is going to be split up into four parts. Each control, oh, hold on. Um, sorry, I've got to admit it. Each going to be... Um, related to one of the four papers that I have worked on over the course of my PhD. So the first one was roughly a review that I participated in a few years ago and is kind of going to be acting as an introduction to the kind of techniques that we've used to address all of the, the rest of the challenges in this work. So, um, why is it? There we go. So before I get into that, let me talk about kind of the general ideas of what we are trying to address here. So first off, what we have here is kind of a, a diagram of a generic complex network in some kind of system. The idea is each of these different uh, circles corresponds to some kind of an object or a node in a graph and each of the edges in an interaction. What we care about is really figuring out ways to make sense of these complex systems without having to um, you know, model each individual connection independently. The fact of the matter is what we see from here is that there's kind of like a um, simpler structure in here. As you can see, there's almost this hierarchical relationship between all these different nodes here, as opposed to just everything randomly connected. And the idea is that we want to be able to exploit these kinds of simpler structures to be able to you know, understand the relationship between the small scale objects and complex emergent behaviors. So, how do we do this? So, more generically, the idea is, imagine when you have some kind of experimental system, right? We're taking some kind of measurements, they're noisy, you know, um, we run an experiment a bunch of different times, we get different outcomes, and, you know, what we really want is to be able to predict what is going to be happening if we run this experiment in a future time. So, the idea is, We've got some kind of experimental design where we've got a bunch of different outcomes that could happen. Let's call those gamma. And there's some probability distribution that's going to determine how likely each of those things is to occur. In general, we're given some kind of limited information, maybe means of something that we care about, variances, correlations, and higher dimensions. But in, gener in, in general terms, we don't really have this P, and we need to figure out what it is. So what we need to do is figure out a way to be able to infer some kind of model of P using only this limited information. And we need something that's minimally biased, meaning that beforehand, you know, we don't know what the answer is, and we want to make sure that our answer is something that's like not completely unreasonable. For example, let's say it's sunny today. We don't want a model that says there's going to be a 100% chance of rain tomorrow with no exceptions. You know, that's putting our biases into the model. In addition, um, we want it to give a unique answer such that we can say something definitive about the system we're trying to describe. And finally, we want it to be able to be tweaked when we get new information. We don't want to have to start over every single time and build a new model. We want something that's kind of adaptive. So the solution that we use is this tool called the principle of maximum entropy, or max end, which I'm going to describe next. So first, what is entropy? Entropy is kind of the idea of um, basically the amount of information content in a probability distribution. So what do we mean by that? It's really how certain we are on future events, or actually the reverse of that. So let's say we've got this uh, P gamma of a certain event. Remembering P is a probability distribution. You know, when this probability distribution is really, really, really narrow, so example being the 100% chance of rain tomorrow, the entropy is going to be really small because, you know, we are putting lots of faith into a very particular outcome. And if it's spread out over many, many different outcomes, the entropy is large. Thus, in other words, the smaller S is, the smaller the entropy is, the more biased we are towards future outcomes. In addition, though, I was saying, so if we want to minimize bias, it would be a logical thing to do to maybe maximize this entropy. But as I said, we also know that we have some kind of prior information. So we've got this entropy, but we also, so suppose we know something about like a mean of some quantity, like we're measuring hand size of our population, for example, and we know mean and variance over that population. We want to figure out 
what is the probability that a given person has a certain size of their hand? We have some information. We put that into these, what we call constraints here, making sure that the probability distribution that we infer out of this thing is going to satisfy the information we have. And we find the model that is going to be satisfying these constraints while also maximizing entropy. The parameters of our model are called Lagrange multipliers or these lambda i's. And those are the parameters that we need to find out. So how do we maximize this? You know, as might be expected, we have this entropy quantity. We go back here, we've got this P log P term. We take the derivative of it with respect to all P gammas, set it to zero, solve. We get this familiar exponential form. The main point here is what we have is this kind of generic looking distribution. What we need is to find out what the parameters of our model are, these lambda i's. And then we just divide it by the z, which normalizes it because the sum of all probabilities of all outcomes have to be equal to one. Okay, so now, um, here's an example. Let's uh, say we wanted to infer the age of a fossil um, as a simple example. So in general, what we have is fossils are made out of carbon, right? But it turns out that there's multiple different kinds of carbon. You've got the staple carbon that people think of, which is C12, but you've also got radioactive C14 in trace amounts. And it turns out by figuring out the relative fraction of the C14 in a given sample of a fossil, you can use some, you can use the techniques of carbon dating to figure out how old it is. The way this is done is we are given um, basically the mean lifetime of a particular C14 atom. So how long we expect a C14 atom to be, you know, around before it decays. And all we can use this piece of information to figure out the probability distribution of the decay of a particular C14 atom and use that to figure out the relative fraction we would expect um, after a certain amount of time. So here's what we do. For those that aren't familiar, this F of T refers to a probability density, which for all intents and purposes, just imagine as a probability distribution. But the point is, we have this entropy quantity over here. We also have this normalization constraint such that the sum of all probabilities is one. And we have our mean constraint such that the average of this probability distribution gives us that mean of the carbon lifetime we talked about. We maximize this quantity you get an exponential decay as your solution. And the point is, what you can use this for is, so on the y-axis here, we've got the fraction of carbon-14 remaining, which is directly proportional to the Z star. And we can use that to invert it, to figure out the lifetime of a particular carbon atom. So the idea is, we have this distribution, we can invert it to date our carbon atom, and it turns out that this exponential decay, as is probably familiar to most of you, is pretty much exactly the correct answer in reality. So the idea is you have this simple piece of information, you can get it very, very easily from experimental data, and it gives you the right answer. So what we wanna do is explore this kind of idea for more complex systems. So here we're talking about dynamical things. We're caring about you know, things that are gonna evolve over time. So imagine like you take a, a dye, you put it in some water, you watch it diffuse, and you wanna figure out how does that how does the distribution of that dye change over time? To do that, we need to extend the ideas of this entropy to an entropy over trajectories or a path entropy, which we call caliber. So the idea is, here we've got many, many different trajectories. Um, here, each of the trajectories is represented by one of these orange lines. And further these trajectories are apart, the more different they are. The idea is here we've got the trajectories spread out. So we aren't particularly certain on what one trajectory is gonna look like. So we have a high path entropy. And on the right, we've got a low path entropy because we have certainty in what this trajectory is gonna look like. So the idea is this is our extension that we're gonna use to extend these ideas, dynamical things that change over time. So now maximum caliber or max cal generalizes this max ant idea to these trajectories. We are given some network of states. So maybe we have all these different, different transitions we talked about. So think of the stock market, for example. It could have a stock go up, go down, it could stay the same a bunch of different transitions. You also can have many different prices that can be at. The idea is you've got some network of states, some transitions, some information about the rates by which they're transitioning. You maximize your caliber, which is going to be this similar to P log P idea. And what you get out is some parameters that are gonna to relate to the probability of a given trajectory. So we, here's an example, for example. Um, what we have on the left in A 
is an example trajectory of how proteins evolving over time. So sometimes the proteins are up, sometimes they're going to be down in terms of the numbers. And what we want to understand is how likely is it to see some particular trajectory of these proteins going up and down? Can we understand the rules governing why these things are transitioning the way that they are? So what we can do is we measure some things like a production rate, how many times this thing is going to be going up, how many times it's going to be going down, being a degradation, and some feedback through a correlation between how many proteins we have and whether they're going to be going up or down. You get these pieces of information, easy to measure experimentally, you maximize your caliper, you get some kind of probability distribution of different trajectories. And what we now have, after all this is done, is a way to specifically model the probability distribution of all these ups and downs over time, given just some pieces of experimental information that we can extract very, very easily. So now, this comes with some challenges. So we had talked about before in those previous examples, essentially looking at one thing, one protein evolving over time, maybe you know, one dye evolving uh, in space, um, one kind of carbon atom you know, evolving, but what happens when we've got many things interacting? So imagine the brain, we've got 100 billion neurons all talking to each other. And what we wanna really understand is how that entire network evolves over time. So let me explain why this is challenging. So here the idea is we've got a trajectory representing each of these objects. So here we've got three, be any number, um, the VJs or VIs correspond to the particular state evolution of some particular, you know, variable. The oranges are going to be the connections. We can maximize our caliber in a similar kind of way. Particularly what we, what we use for the simple case, we have means and correlations. The mean activity at a particular state, the correlation between each of the states at any given time, we maximize our caliber, we get out this probability distribution. Here the parameters are H's, which are corresponding to the mean constraints, and KIJs, which are corresponding to the correlations. The problem here, though, is let's say we've got 100 billion things, right? We've got a lot of H's and KIJs. The problem is these parameters are really, really hard to, to compute exactly. So what we need to do instead is figure out an approximate way to infer them, such that we can extend this idea to really large systems and not be bogged down by the impossible complexity of just solving for these parameters. So let me explain how we do this. We use two levels of approximation, both kind of relating to the idea that if we stared at one of these particular nodes, we might be able to figure out some kind of effective way of describing the system. So let me give you an example. Suppose we cut these orange connections and we were just focusing on a particular trajectory. As I've shown before, you know, solving for max cal problems for a single trajectory is not that difficult. If we just if we didn't have these interactions, that would be very doable. So what if we took the average effect of each of these other nodes on this guy? So we have the effect from K and from I on J. We just average over them and say, let's describe this as an effective one body thing. We're just describing the, the dotted line uh, object by itself and just stop there. This is called the uncoupled approximation. It's related to kind of mean field techniques in statistical physics. And it turns out this provides a way to be able to exactly use that intuition that we can solve a bunch of one body problems and say something about our system. The problem though is we still don't have any information about the interactions. So what we can do though is take that simple uncoupled approximation, expand upon it, by doing kind of a uh, little perturbation technique and figure out kind of a linear relationship between, um, so we call it the linear coupling approximation, where we take this uncoupled thing and expand it a little bit. And this allows us to use the information we have from the correlations to come up with an efficient um, way to be able to infer the rest of the parameters very, very well. So let me explain how these two approximations work. So first, for this example, let's take two genes. We've got the blue guy and the yellow guy. They're both mutually repressing each other. So what that means is that when one is on, the other one is off in terms of, you know, an, an amount of proteins that we'd be able to measure. So as an example, let's look at B on the bottom here. We see that at the beginning, where the y-axis is the number of proteins, 
blue is on, yellow is off, and occasionally they switch. And what happens is only one of them is going to be expressed at a given time. Now, as we make the interaction strength less inhibitory, in other words, we make this K more positive, closer to zero, what happens is now, suddenly we go through this transition and both of them can be expressed at the same time because the interaction is sufficiently new. So the problem is in, in, in the past, this transition was really hard to describe, especially analytically. You can run this kind of model over a bunch of different Ks and just say, ha, I look at the graph, I have this transition happening at a particular place, but there was really no way to understand why and how that was happening. Instead, by using the uncoupled approximation, what we can do is solve the system analytically and precisely gauge exactly where this transition happens. So we start with this two green, um, two um, points at the bottom, each corresponding to different steady states, one guy being on, the other one being off, and vice versa. As you increase K, these steady states where, that the system occupies kind of combine together, and we get this transition to having a single steady state. The benefit of our model, though, is we can compute exactly where this transition happens. And not only that, in the un uncoupled approximation, away from this critical point, the transition point, we can get the distribution of proteins almost exactly. And the, the point is we can use the, do this extremely efficiently. We don't have to waste computational effort to be able to get this probability distribution because we can get exactly using really, really simple methods. Now, what if we want to be a bit more exact? What we can do is now use the linear coupling max cow approximation to be able to infer the interactions, so not just the mean field stuff, but now also understand the relationship between these Ks. So here's a different example. On the left, each of these blue dots corresponds to a neuron at a particular time. Going vertically down is the evolution in time. So this is time step zero, one, two, et cetera. The green lines correspond to interactions. And what we have is that the system is in a steady state for our modeling purposes. We've got H's that are gonna describe the effects of the means and the K's that are gonna be describing the effect of the interactions. What we wanna do is infer these guys super, super easily without having to do all the nightmare that I discussed before. So what we have in B is when we use our method, the black line corresponds to perfect accuracy and the rest of the dots correspond to the parameters that are inferred by our model. And as you can see, the error is pretty small. Although, once again, it's hard to gauge this just by looking at a graph. So instead, in the rest of the panels, we describe qualitatively how our method correctly um, describes the system. So in the middle here, we've got the actual system that we're simulating. So what's known about neurons is around a particular point when um, the interactions are kind of toggled in kind of a biologically reasonable uh, location, you, you notice that when you stare at neural activities, you initially often have neurons that are pretty much silent, and then occasionally a few fire, and then after those few fire, suddenly you get cascades of many neurons firing because those ones that fire kind of trigger the rest to fire simultaneously. And then you get these spikes as a result, where you get sudden on and then everything turning off. So these are called neural avalanches. And in our uncoupled approximation on the top in blue here, it's not just those, those um, behaviors are not picked up at all. But in our linear coupled approximation, those behaviors are almost perfectly uh, picked up. Because of the stochasticity, they're not at the same exact location. The idea is the distribution and frequency of them are going to be roughly the same. To show this um, even more clearly, what we have in D is the probability distribution of different qualitatively you know, macroscopic behaviors. We call this synchrony. In particular, each of these neurons can be on or off, on being plus one, off being minus one. And if we sum up over a bunch of neurons, take the average of them at a particular time, we get this number called synchrony. If it's one, they're all increasing at the same time. If it's negative one, they're all off at the same time. And if it's zero, they're not really correlated with each other at all. And by looking at the distribution of this quantity, we can understand kind of the macroscopic behaviors of our system. The actual, uh, the actual model gives this orange curve. Linear coupled gets it pretty well. This is the, its distribution that's picked up and the uncoupled does terribly. And also, when we talk about the correlation strength, so here we looked at a particular value of the parameters, but if we looked at, you know, kind of a wide range of parameters, 
we're starting at beta equals, this beta equals one. This, this was all of the panels that we showed here is beta equals one, where the error is actually reasonably large. As you weaken these correlations, the approximation only gets better from what is shown up here. So the idea is you have two different approximation methods. One that's very useful for getting kind of the, the macroscopic um, analytical relationships between many variables, and one which is precise and efficient way of really um, accurately describing the probability distribution of complex systems. So now what we want to do is kind of so describe Yeah? Uh, can I ask you a question about the loss uh, transparency, or the PPT? Uh, about what? The, the, loss, uh, the loss PPT. Yes. So yeah. can you explain to me what exactly do you mean by this uh, wiring diagram? Uh, I mean, my understanding is you're trying to look at, well, in each layer that represents, say, for example, this is a three node uh, network. Uh, oh, it's just, it, it, could, it could be an arbitrary. So the actual simulated one was like 40, but that doesn't make oh. for a good drawing. Oh, no, no, that's fine. But, but are you trying to draw a, like a, for this example, three node network evolving with respect to time? Yeah, so what, here's what we have. What okay. we have is we've got some randomly chosen interactions. So we've got different yeah. KIJs for each of these yeah. nodes. Yeah. Um, we also have time dependent interactions such that a node at time zero is going to influence the probability of a node at time one or at time two, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the green lines represent. So the oh, idea is there's, yeah. yeah, I should have mentioned that. So there is yeah, a, there is a relationship between previous times and future times, oh, which right, is right. what kind of makes this problem a little bit interesting because we right. can not only get, you know, the, the network relationships at a particular time, but also their influences at future times. Mm. I see. Okay. Uh, if I may follow up uh, a little bit, I was also wondering how individual neurons are modeled here. So for the actual, uh, I'm asking. Yeah, so here, basically, they're, it's an Ising model, right? They're either on or off for this. Um, you can use more complex models, but we use something very simple because it's very easy to describe using the language. Okay, that's 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 the gist. It's either on or off. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. how, how do you determine the uh, well? Presumably, the, in each time layer, you have the uh, within this uh, time layer, you have the connections, the wiring, and also yeah. the uh, the inter uh, layer uh, wiring, which is time dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, sort of distinguish these? Uh, Hiring in, in your inferring uh, method. Uh, how so, do you know which one is, you know, the within the layer and the interlayer uh, wiring? How do you determine, how, how do you so, set, it, set it up like that? Oh. So let me go back a bit. This is okay. the probability distribution, right? Sure. So we have a different KIJ of T comma yeah. S, where actually yeah. it's T minus S for the steady state, but the point is we've got this coupling We've basically got this, this coupling function. The mm -hmm. idea is each of these would give a different value. We've got an exact mapping between the time correlation function mm -hmm. and, well, in space and time, actually, and oh. these different couplings. So the idea is we infer it by the, the sheer fact that there's only one value of the coupling that would give you the right probability distribution that's exactly mm -hmm. consistent with the data that we have. In mm -hmm. practice, of course, you might need a lot of information to be able to get these correlations exactly. Hmm. But what we can do is, you know, have several different models based on certain error bars and use this kind of method several different hmm. times. But roughly speaking, if you have all of your correlations perfect, there's a perfect hmm. mapping between the, the information we have and exactly which interaction is going to be the relevant one. So I think it might be helpful for Jin to say that at a given plane, you have the three states of a given neuron and then the transition from time t to t mm. plus one mm. is really just an Ising matrix that just says, okay, if I'm in this state, it's a Markov matrix. If I'm in this state at this moment, then I can do the following possible things at the next moment. Yeah, mm. roughly speaking. Roughly speaking, because obviously, you know, it, it's an arbitrary time dependency, but yes, that would be the idea of how you would do this. 
Um, okay, so can I continue? Oh, sure. All right. So now we want to talk about something that's a little bit more brain-like. So what do I mean by that? So here we had these ideas of Maxwell to understand interactions. What we care about here is really understanding the collective behavior of many, many neurons. So you start, you know, if I wanted to understand like memory, you know, thoughts, being able to move my arm, all those involve many, many neurons simultaneously. But oftentimes, a lot of them are highly interacting and doing very similar things. I mean, if you imagine like something like brain waves, where you have a bunch of neurons, they're all firing in some kind of, you know, organized manner, and it propagates across the brain. The idea is these collective phenomena have a lot of complex dynamics, but we can use kind of a, an effective model to describe them. So this has been done. This is, the traditional way of doing this is called the Wilson-Cohen model. Uh, here we have a simplified representation of it. The idea is, as I was saying before, imagine each neuron is being on or off. Here, active or quiescent, quiescent meaning silent. And suppose that all we cared about was the fraction of neurons that were either active or quiescent at a given time. Um, how would we describe the system? Well, the Wilson-Cohen model answers that question. And what would happen is that we have that the, um, for the simplest example, the problem is that the fraction of neurons doesn't evolve over time. The particular neuron that's firing changes, but you get some kind of an equilibrium distribution, because as you can see here from those that are familiar, you've got two states. There's not gonna be any interesting time evolution. So what happens though, and what is missing to describe real system, turns out to be the refractory period of neurons. If you think about a neuron, what happens is after it fires, it has to wait a little bit before it can fire again. Thus, we have effectively a third state. So now we have a system where we've got quiescent, active, refractory, and then back to quiescent. And this transition allows us to explore much more complex dynamics. So here what we have is from these three states, what we get is that now the fraction of neurons in each state does evolve over time and it oscillates in this example. So what we want to do now is explore what kind of features such a model can describe and how do we actually, you know, more rigorously derive this model. So here we utilize these four pieces of information. For each of those three, pair, three states, we've got a transition. We've got quiescent to active, active to refractory, and refractory to quiescent. Each of those, we can measure the mean rate i.e. the mean fraction of neurons at each time that is going to be transitioning, that gives us four pieces of information for an average rate. But as you know, I explained before, neurons regulate each other. Because of the feedback, the more neurons that fire, the more of an effect that they're gonna have on other neurons. And we need to include this using a term, um, using a correlation term, this fourth piece of information. The idea is knowing these four pieces of information, we can fully describe the model that I was talking about earlier and we can demonstrate really complex patterns of activity that the previous model was not able to demonstrate. Whoops. Um, okay, so the model that we get out of this, I'm gonna skip a couple of steps, and the point is we get these two equations describing how the populations of quiescent and active neurons evolve over time. There's also an, an equivalent equation for the fractory um, fraction, but of course, we're talking about fractions of stuff. The sum of the fractions of stuff has to be equal to one, so we really only have two equations that we care about. So what we have is we've got these two equations that describe how stuff evolves over time. We've got a coupling um, between, so this PQA is actually described by an effective term where we've got an H and a J. This J appears because of the correlation, but the moral of the story here. So we've got this model as a function of four parameters, two constant rates, PAR and PRQ, this firing threshold H and an average synaptic coupling J. And what happens is the more neurons that fire, so the higher pi A is, the larger this term is going to be, or the more negative if J is negative, but the more effect the other ones are gonna have. And when this is zero, we just have a raw base constant rate. So what, what does this model look like? Let's imagine that we have J is positive, i.e. when a neuron fires, it makes other neurons nearby more likely to fire. We get complex oscillations when the parameters are tuned correctly. What we get is, so here is a typical limit cycle behavior. What do I mean by that? Each of these points, um, pi A and pi Q that we have on this curve correspond to possible states that the system can be in. And what happens is 
you start in some value of pi a, you evolve it, it increases to pi q, it circles around this curve, transitions around and, you know, basically circles around in some predefined way. Each time it does this, it ends up at a slightly different place until it repeats itself. And by changing the J, you change the position on this. And what you get is different complex oscillatory patterns depending on J. The moral of the story here is different values of J are gonna give different patterns of oscillations, meaning that by toggling J, the brain can in theory store many different patterns of complex activities. So the idea is you've got a single parameter that can describe lots of information in a very, very easy way. Now, we also have a different behavior that happens when the J is negative. Here, for inhibitory dynamics, what happens is you start out in some kind of steady state. So like I said, for the Wilson and Cohen model, you've got boring, everything approaches the same, same value, constant activation. You, you decrease J a sufficient amount, though you start getting these oscillations, but they're different than the oscillations we described before. Because as you increase J more, what happens is eventually, here, you've got period two oscillations, which eventually as J is decreased, become period four, so on and so forth until a critical point is reached, where now the dynamics become chaotic, meaning that the, the um, system never repeats itself. So what does this look like? So for, before talking about the chaos, the difference between these oscillations and the previous excitatory oscillations is that these are of a lower amplitude and much faster. So the idea is they are qualitatively different than the excitatory oscillations. You start at the excitatory here, the amplitude goes off the screen and you see that they're very slow. This is one peak and this is another peak. For the inhibitory, this is one peak, next peak, and so on and so forth. It's clearly much faster. So obviously this is gonna be useful if the brain needs to um, be computing something at a much higher frequency than would be allowed by the excitatory couplings. But also it stores information in a different way. So. Let's say we were running this system. We had a particular value of J. I said it's chaotic, but what happens is you run the system, get all these oscillations. And if you take a histogram of the amplitude over time, it turns out you get some really nice looking probability distribution with predefined peak. And if you change J slightly, you get a different probability distribution. The idea is in theory, the information in these J's can be robustly stored in this probability distribution. You know, even with the stochasticity and the randomness because of the chaos, you can store information in these different signals if you had, you know, some kind of upstream th or downstream thing that was able to kind of, um, kind of equilibrate itself to all these different probability densities from different values of J. So roughly speaking, we've got two different, we've got two different interesting regimes of behavior and one in the middle is kind of the boring Wilson-Cohen thing. So the idea is you've got, when, you, when your J and H's are sufficiently small and in some kind of particular region, um, which is the light blue, you don't get anything interesting. It reaches some kind of fixed steady state. But if the couplings are really negative or really positive and in the right way, what you get is these complex oscillations that each store information in a completely different way and the way that these information is stored is actually very, very in line with what has been seen experimentally. So the idea is this provides a new way of understanding the mechanism underlying how neurons may store information. And more interestingly, this can be tested experimentally. So these two parameters that are really of interest here, the synaptic coupling and these firing threshold are two parameters that can be experimentally manipulated. So given the right experimental setup, you could literally recreate this phase diagram experimentally. So this is all synthetically done. You could recreate this and test all these predictions. And the idea is if correct, we now have a new way of being able to understand these systems that the previous model, which had been around for 50 years, was not able to. So now we can talk about the final part of this, which is a little bit different, a little bit more expensive, experimental, but also kind of building on these ideas we talked about earlier on how we use statistical physics to understand emergent properties in complex systems. So first let me give an overview. The brain has enormous energy demands compared to organs to the rest of the body. For um, the brain takes up maybe about roughly 2% of the body, but it uses about 20% of the energetic um, uh, resources of the entire body. So it's very energetically demanding. And what happens is in older age, 
the ability of neurons to use glucose declines. So the one possible reason for this is, you know, as is pretty commonly known, older people have really high rates of type 2 diabetes. You know, what this means is that those cells become insulin resistant and insulin being the hormone that is required to, in certain cells, to be able to take up glucose in the cells. So if they're insulin resistant, cells, including neurons, have trouble being able to take up glucose. So now as a result, they don't have the proper, um, the, the proper fuel resources intracellularly that would allow them to be able to use, do their normal functions. So what can we do about this though? There's alternatives. So ketone bodies, for example, the two molecules seen on the bottom here um, are already used in the body naturally to provide a backup fuel source when glucose is scarce. So it's been experimentally shown, ketones provide more free energy than glucose, i.e. they're a more efficient fuel source. And more importantly, their metabolism does not decline with age. So the idea is you could use these ketones in theory to be able to replace some of the glucose that can't be used because of uh, insulin resistance. So what do we do this? Experimentally, what do we care about? We really want to understand the relationship between energy and um, brain activity. So we're saying that glucose metabolism decreases with age and brain activity changes as a result, but we want to be able to manipulate kind of the, the, the axis of brain activity versus energy. And we can do this by, you know, selectively giving people ketones. So how do we do this? The experimental, um, the experimental type that we use here is called functional MRI or fMRI. And it's used to understand how the relationship between brain activity and um, different things that we tell a person to do. So what we have on is from fMRI, you can measure different patterns of activation and also two regions of the brain. So we have these signals over the entire brain. If two regions of the brain are firing at the same time, we can infer that they're often that they're talking to each other, i.e. that they're connected or correlated with each other. And from what we want to do is take this information, describe it dynamically, and build a model that's going to be able to describe how these features change as a function of age. So what's the first thing we learn? Let's say we take this for you know an average person. We take we look at an old person, we look at a young person. We compare their correlation matrices by looking at by parceling the brain into 498 regions, and we ask, how do these correlations change? Turns out that there's a simple global pattern that emerges. So you empirically look at the, the pattern and you subtract the correlations between young and old people. You get this kind of matrix, you see this giant red blob. What this tells us that uh, is that essentially, because this thing can be decomposed very simply, there's a really low dimensional representation of what's going on. Roughly speaking, most of the correlations are decreasing with some exceptions that I'm not gonna go into. But the point here is there's some kind of global effect on brain activity. And this implies that we can use something like statistical physics to understand how this may emerge from the properties of individual brain regions. So what we use here to describe this is the Ising model. So I described before, two papers ago, in the idea of synchrony. So here, the idea is if two brain regions are uh, activated at the same time, uh, or so if a brain region is activated, we give it a plus one. If it's inactive, as I'll describe more precisely later, it gets a minus one. Now we take this over all of our 498 regions, take the average over their ons or offs, and we get a number of synchrony. If they're all on, we get one, if they're all off, we get minus one, and somewhere in between, we get these zeros. So how does this change as a function of how correlated these different regions are, i.e. how strongly they are talking to each other? So it turns out that there's a critical point where we go from having um, dynamics that are close to basically being zero synchrony to more organized plus one or minus one synchrony um, in the back. This is a function of the, something called an interaction strength or this Lagrange multiplier, lambda. In particular, this uppercase lambda is, refer, is, is used to refer to a distance from a critical point. So lambda capital equals zero is referring to the transition point where we go from one peak to two peaks, which is this red line here. When lambda capital is positive, we get two peaks stuff. And when lambda capital is 
negative, we get one piece of stuff. So what we want to next do is first probe this a little bit more deeply, but then map actual brain activity to this model. So let me describe the Ising model a little more in a little more detail, explain how it works. So the idea is we've got a bunch of nodes that are connected to each other, each corresponding to a brain region. They're all fully connected in this case, um, assumed with the same connection strength. Because what we really want to understand is the property of the averages here. Lowercase lambda is that interaction strength. The one before was the uppercase lambda is just a rescaled version of this. But the point is, imagine we had two brain regions, you know, denoted by, you know, these circles. So let's say they're both on or both off. And we wanted to say, what's the probability of seeing the question mark over here? So let's say, what's the probability that that's going to be on or off? Because lambda is really, really large. There's a high probability that it's going to be similar to its neighbors. So in the top, it's going to be likely to be red. In the bottom, it's going to be likely to be blue. But if lambda is low, it's a 50-50 chance. They're independent of each other. So that's one part of this. But the other part is we're caring about synchrony here. So I said this is kind of an average behavior where we average over all of the nodes. In B, you see we've got these two red dots over here. We rotate it, we rotate it, and we've got three different ways where we get the same value of synchrony because all we care about is the number of each of these. So the idea is there's two components that are going to be going into understanding the probability distribution of different synchronies. How this, this um, interaction through lambda and also the number of ways each value of synchrony can occur. Run this through, you get this probability distribution is going to look like something like this. The idea is you've got these two components, one the combinatorial term and one kind of the energetic term dealing with the, the lambdas. So when lambda is large, what you get is that the um, being similar to its neighbors kind of uh, component wins out, and you get that high synchronies are going to be more likely. But when lambda is low, because there are more combinatorial ways for this to occur, you get that the low synchronies are going to be more likely. So now let me describe how we map this to brain activity. What we have is take some kind of generic brain signal, so the fMRI, that's what we have up here. Let's say this is for some particular brain region. We zoom in on this. And what we do is we need to binarize it to map it to the Ising model. What we say is we've got an fMRI signal. If it's increasing, we give it a plus one. If it's decreasing, we give it a minus one. And we use that to binarize it. We take the average over all of the brain regions to come up with this um, number synchrony to get a new signal. And what we do is histogram it to understand the probability distribution of different values of synchrony. We then fit this, uh, fit a particular value of capital lambda to it, um, denoted here, as I was saying before, just this rescaled value of that interaction, meaning that capital lambda equals zero is that switching critical point. Once we have this, we now can say something about how the parameters are going to be changing under different conditions. And what I didn't show here, but was is in the paper, is essentially this model works extremely well. So the distribution predicted by the Ising model fits almost perfectly to the distribution seen in the actual data. So the idea is this isn't just something we chose arbitrarily. It actually you know, reflects the, the data that we were describing. So now, let me explain the two experimental conditions. What we have is that when we're, try we're just trying to describe the effects of age on a person's brain, but also the effects of these ketones. So we look at these separately. So the first, for the, for the age, we use the publicly available ChemCan data set. Um, N equals 636 subjects over many different ages. So the idea is we can fit lambda for each of these and see how it changes over the different populations. Uh, to understand the, the effect of the ketones, what was done previously is a pilot study of 12 subjects where, we, uh, where their brain activity is measured on ketones and glucose separately. And what we can do is fit a value of lambda for each of those separately and see how lambda changes on a ketone diet versus a glucone, glucone diet. So what we have is with age, lambda decreases, reflecting you know kind of a decrease in this connectivity. And in with ketones, the lambda increases. The idea is they're doing kind of opposite things. And as you'd expect, if this is corresponding to energy, decreasing the connections, you know, is what happens with age. And ketones, which are higher energy, should be doing the opposite thing. So now. What does this mean in terms of actual patterns of brain activity? Well, what we have is that lambda corresponds to 
two unique patterns of, I mean, the different patterns of synchrony correspond to two unique patterns of brain activity. So when synchrony is low, we have that here, these different brains are corresponding to different correlation patterns. When synchrony is low, correlations are kind of sparse and uh, objects are connected basically to their nearest neighbors. So what we have is, what we have is that essentially, um, this is what be called in uh, neuroscience a segregated um, map, where each of these uh, brain regions is talking to its local, local nearest neighbors. And you can imagine as being responsible for kind of specialized functions um, in a particular brain region. But occasionally, uh, the brain regions, so the, the functions that are being done at each of these uh, individual specialized regions, they need to consolidate their information or integrate it from one region to another region by communicating with each other across long distances. So these are called integrated, reg uh, integrated patterns of activity and correspond to high synchrony networks. And what happens is the distribution between these integrated and segregated patterns um, changes as a function of lambda. When lambda equals zero, you have that you've got a 50-50 balance between these two things. When lambda decreases, what you have is that you get a focus on only segregated and the probability of integrated kind of goes to zero, which is the orange line. And the reverse happens when lambda is greater than zero. So the idea is now we've got this, this Ising model describes not only you know this relationship between these different values of synchrony, but also reflecting particular patterns of brain activity. So finally, the moral of this story is that younger brains turn out to be poised at a critical point. What we mean by that is there's that switching point where you go from high synchrony to low synchrony. If I look at a younger brain, they're poised right here. So you've got a balance between these integrated and segregated activities, as you would see, you know, from over here. And the older brain, however, becomes far away from this critical point. So now you get a focus on only the segregated activities and you lose the ability to use integrated activities. So what happens with aging is essentially you lose one of these patterns of brain activity that could be, that is likely to be absolutely essential to cognitive, you know, ability. And what happens when you give a person ketones is suddenly now, if you're over here, in theory, if ketones increase the value of lambda, you start moving in the other direction. And if it's since it's related to energy, the idea is you start moving back to this critical point when you give a person ketones. So moral of the story is all of these projects together kind of correspond to our different ways of understanding the collective dynamics of really complex systems. And we talked about the brain, we talked about you know, gene regulatory network, we talked about some cool math. The idea is these techniques are used to infer properties in really, really complex systems all over the map.